Welcome everyone to my 300th episode of the Casual Friday podcast. I asked a couple of weeks ago on various social media platforms, uh, any questions that you might have for me for this 300th episode and you delivered. So I have a lot of questions. I'm hoping that I can answer all of them and include all of them in this video. We'll just see how long it goes. There's a few different categories. There's the largest category is about my personal knitting um, evolution and things that I like or dislike, that sort of thing. There are questions about the channel. There are questions about other sorts of crafts or interests that I might have. And then there are some sort of more personal health related questions as well. So I'm going to do my best to answer all of them. Uh, and I hope that I didn't miss anybody who left me a question. So let's get started. The majority of the questions uh, have to do with my knitting, my own personal knitting life. So let's go through those questions. Mary Lou asks, who were the ones inspiring your interest, skill, or passion for various crafts? Relatives, teachers, neighbors? In which order did your skills, interests, passions of the crafts develop? I was always a crafty kid. My mother always was very supportive of that. Like she didn't buy co coloring books. We had lots of paper and color pencils and paints and we craft whatever we wanted. She was very supportive of that. She wasn't really crafty herself. She used to sew for herself before my parents got divorced and she went back to grad school and didn't have time. She didn't really do other crafts, but she was very supportive of it. My grandma was a knitter. And so, you know, when they would come to visit, uh, I might see her knitting. My brother's also crafty. He's a woodworker now. Uh, my grandpa taught him woodworking skills when he was in middle school and we both would sew. Uh, he used to make stuffed animals for girlfriends and things like that. So we were both very crafty and we remained very crafty and appreciate it. I think that's just sort of, and my dad is very artistic. He did lapidary, so uh, stone polishing and made jewelry, custom jewelry as a hobby job. When we go visit him, there's almost always some kind of craft things that we were doing. So it was just around and encouraged in general in my life. What order did my skills, interests, passions develop? My mom taught us this, how to use the sewing machine when I was a kid and I did a lot of embroidery. I used to get those like iron on patterns that you could put on your, I put, had overalls and I would embroider things. Um, so that was something I did when I was living in Ireland in 1986 and I was so bored and one of my flatmates came home with a knitting project. I went, oh my God. I'll do that. <laughs> so it was just like, oh, that's something fun to do. So I think it was sort of like, it was, it was around, it was encouraged, and it was just sort of internal. So internally motivated. Sue Henderson says, just thank you. You've improved my sock knitting so much. The Finchley Graft and Instatot heel are now regular go-tos. What's your favorite item to knit? I was a sweater knitter from the start. That's all I did for 19 years. And then in 2005, I just exploded with, you know, learning all kinds of things. So I will knit all kinds of things, but socks is the other thing. So still love sweaters and socks. Those are my two favorite. And I do do other things, but those, those are the two favorite. I usually have one or both of those going kind of all the time. Neve C says, if only one of your knitting knitted works could be put in a museum to represent you, which one would you pick and why? Well, that's going to be this sweater, the Edwardian sweater, because I, it isn't that I wear this at all. I never intended to wear it and certainly don't wear it, but I think it represents a lot of things about me personally and also as a knitter. It represents my drive to learn. Like I had a question about this pattern and I couldn't get the answer to it without knitting it. And then when I knit it, I realized, oh my gosh, there's so much to learn uh, by doing this. I'm gonna do this whole project. We're gonna knit a sweater from each deck, you know, like, cause I wanna keep learning things and I wanna know more about this, you know. So if there was one project that kind of represents me, it, it would be this, this sweater. So the next three questions are kind of all related to each other. Emo Kultamalo 
says, I love your casual Friday episode so much. It's like catching up with a friend over some knitting. Thank you for so many hours of fun and education. I'd love to know what has been the most challenging and rewarding thing you've learned in knitting. And then Robin Reed said, 300, eh? Not just any 300, but the depth of your research for them has to be counted too. My questions would be around what surprised you, charmed you, excited you, intrigued you, most changed your thinking, stands out for you. How long have you got? Linda W. Sousa said, I'm sure this will be a common question, but I'm curious about what your biggest crafting challenge has been over the years, whether it's a specific project, an injury, etc. So I've kind of got two things. The rewarding and challenging and surprising, if we're talking about a specific, you know, knitted project. It would again be this Edwardian sweater because so much came out of it that I didn't expect and then drove me into four years of research and accumulating vintage knitting books and all, you know all kinds of things. But the other thing would be the master hand knitting program. That took me seven years. There was a four-year gap in the middle but it, it was intensive and it really changed my knitting life and my knitting perspective because it taught me or I learned from doing it how to learn more about knitting. And since the, the thing about me is that I, I have this drive to learn and I want to learn more, I loved figuring out how to learn more about knitting without you know, having somebody instruct me individually. Like, how do I figure this out? How do I, where do I, how do I do this? Can I figure this out on my own if I just get out some needles and yarn? Can I work through this? So those are the two, the two things. Lola Cromwell said, I'd love to know what your most treasured knitted item is and whether it was made by you, a friend, relative, stranger, etc." Thank you so much for everything you've taught me over the years. So there are two knitted things that, that I treasure. One is my Red Aaron sweater. I wear this a lot on the channel. I started this in 2005 when I kind of got back into knitting. I started master hand knitting programs, started exploring all different kinds of things. Six months later, so in the fall of 2005, I heard about this Follow the Leader Aaron Knit Along. I was in these email groups, yeah, because this is before Ravelry, before YouTube. And I heard about this Follow the Leader Aaron Knit Along where um, Janet Zabo uh, had designed like all of the cables for a sweater and then you could learn how to knit it to your size with the kind of neck you wanted, whether you wanted it pullover or cardigan, all kinds of things that she kind of walked you through that. So you didn't have to also figure out all the cables. Um, but you learned how to swatch for that. You learned how to figure out how deep you like your, your neck, or how you like its shape, how deep you like your armholes, all kinds of things. So it's fantastic. And she had us knit it at a firm gauge. This was knit in worsted weight, and but I knit it at a DK weight. So if in stockinette, you normally would get five stitches per inch. I would use a needle that would have given me five and a half st stitches per inch. The fabric is much firmer. It holds itself because the, the cables add weight to it and so it doesn't stretch out it holds itself up it doesn't pill i mean this thing is almost 20 years old and and it's fantastic and it, you know i got some holes in the elbows i put you know patches on it i redid the neck at one point because it was too wide and shallow and i found some of the original yarn in a closet and I'm like oh I can redo that next. So this is something that I knit for myself that I love. The other thing that I treasure I knit for my daughter Nina uh, when I was pregnant with her. This is when I would do back stitch or whip stitch for my seaming uh, but this is the sweater that I knit for her to wear in her hospital photos. I love this little sweater so this is just something that I will never never give away uh, never get rid of. I love it. I keep it here in my office in a in a little cubby near my desk. Moon Basket Knits wants to know what is the least favorite thing that I've ever knitted. And I have to say, I have no idea. If I do not enjoy knitting something, I stop knitting it and I rip it out or I throw it out. If something is tedious, boring, if I hate the way it looks or the yarn isn't working well, I, I don't like the stitch pattern. I just stop knitting it. I don't finish it. I mean, there are things that I finish and I'm like, eh, I don't love it. Uh, it might get donated or whatever. I just don't remember them. So I, I have no idea. Stuart 
from the wool patch he owns a yarn shop in the uk and he also has a youtube channel he says congratulations for a bit of fun i'd be fascinated to know if there is any skill or technique in knitting that even you uh, means you still have to click on a youtube tutorial to check and refresh yourself with how it's done if so who do you choose to watch but in all seriousness well done and thank you you have impacted on my journey and development in the knitting world so much since I left teaching in 2016. Keep those vids coming, Stuart. I will occasionally watch one of my own videos. <laughs> so I typically make videos of techniques that I use, but sometimes they are techniques that I don't use very often and there's enough steps in them that I'm like, what do I do here? So an example of that is a one row buttonhole. And there's a specific point in that buttonhole where I always question whether I'm supposed to do this or that. And so a lot of times I will go to my own video on that. This is, you know, what do I have to return to for to refresh my memory? So usually it will be a video that I've done and so I'll just go do that. Otherwise, I, I will just reach for some of my reference books that I have within reach because I can probably find it faster than I can find the correct spot in somebody else's video that tells me exactly what I want to know. If it's something new, it's not a refresher. It's like I'm learning something new, then I do a Google search. And sometimes Suzanne Bryan, she's another master hand knitter, sometimes she will have a video on something that I haven't done one on and I might watch that. But usually I just Google or search YouTube and in that case, I will watch a bunch of videos because I know that there's gonna be more than one way of doing it. And I want to see if I can figure out what the commonality is. If somebody's knitting in a funky way and they are not mentioning that, I tend to discard that. So I don't tend to have another channel that I go to regularly. Um, I have 300 Casual Friday videos, but I have more than 300 technique videos. So a lot of times I, I just, Go look at my one of my own. <laughs> Sandy Bean One asks, "You always show sweaters you are knitting for yourself. Do you ever knit for your husband?" Also, I believe it was a couple of years ago that your husband was going to learn to knit. Did that ever happen, Barbara? It was my daughter's fiance that learned to knit. So he he learned to knit. I tried to teach him, and he struggled with it. And then he learned again later. Uh, and he does it periodically, but he doesn't really keep it up consistently. But my husband's never been, he watches all my videos and he know, he, know, he actually knows quite a bit about knitting, um, but he hasn't learned to knit. I have knit him two sweaters. One was probably early on in our marriage when I didn't really, I just trusted if this was to fit size whatever, just knit that size without looking at the finished measurements and is that really something is that really how he wants it to to fit and it ended up just being enormous on him uh, i think i got gauge and it was just too it was just way too big and then the second sweater i knit for him was the sweater i had to design for the master hand knitting program i'll show you a picture of of him wearing that sweater he likes hats he will go on Ravelry and search for hat patterns for me. And, and if we're at a, going on a trip somewhere and we're looking at yarn, he will pick out a yarn that he likes. And so we will work together um, to find something. So I knit him a hat every couple of years. I've knit him a couple of pairs of socks and he wears them uh, in his rotation of socks, but he, he just thinks they're too much work. Like I, so I knit him the things that he's going to appreciate and that he wants. He doesn't like having to try things on a lot. So trying to knit him a sweater that would actually fit him the way that he wants it to fit would probably take some time and effort on my part and his willingness on him to put it on <laughs> in the different stages. Uh, he also gets frustrated if something doesn't fit him the way he wants I'm like okay I'll just rip it out and then he gets like oh no that's so much work I'm like but if I don't do that it won't fit you so so I do knit for him but I don't knit tons and tons for him tech editor blue crab knits says I know you love texture such as cables is there a knit technique you have never tried and have no interest in trying usually if it's a technique that is new to me like I remember 
just when Distitch came out, that book, I was like, what is this? And I, I wanted to, to try it to see what it was, to figure out if it was something that I would want to do. I will swatch things a lot of times. And then I'm like, okay, this is not for me. I try to keep myself intellectually honest and not have an opinion about something until I've tried it, whether that's um, a technique or a type of project type or a stitch pattern or something like that. Uh, I might look at it and go, not for me and move on. But if there's tons and tons of people talking about it and raving about it, and I'm like, I don't get it. I will often try it just to see if I can understand what all the fuss is about. And sometimes I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. And other times I'm like, I still don't get it. But at least I know, and I've tried it, and I, and I can be intellectually honest about having an opinion from experience. Shirley Mohuidan, I think is how it's, it's, happy 300th anniversary. I love your deep dives into so many topics. I'd like to know what your favorite needles are for various projects, like socks, hats, sweaters, based on what types of yarn and how that has evolved evolved over the years. So when I was learning to knit and I was only knitting sweaters, this is back in the 80s, sweater patterns were mostly knit flat, bottom up, in pieces, and then you seamed them. And the needles that you would usually find at the yarn shops were straight needles. And so that's what I use. And so 14 inch straight needles. And I learned over time that I liked pointy, I liked slick metal needles with pointy tips. And I don't know how many years ago it was, at least 15 years ago, probably more, I came across Signature Needle Arts needles. You could decide how pointy you wanted the tip and you had choice of the knobs at the end. And the way I knit was I would anchor this needle at the junction of my hip and thigh. So I was not holding on to the right needle, but I was touching it. My very first knitting video on YouTube from 2007, about 30 seconds long, but it's it's showing me knit and you're, it's like an across the room type of point of view. I will link to it down below. It's really low resolution because again, this is 2007, but I'm pretty sure I was using these needles in that demonstration. In 2005 though, when I started the Master Hand Knitting Program and I started learning more about other knitting styles and I was starting to knit other types of things that were knit in the round, like socks and hats and things. What I was finding is that my knitting style, which is English, I was throwing and I had very even tension, very comfortable to knit. Uh, I really liked it, but it didn't work well for knitting in the round. I tried knitting belts with really long double points. Uh, that didn't work well for me. I tried all kinds of things to be able to use my knitting style and work in the round. Uh, and it just didn't work well. So I thought, well, I'm going to have to learn continental so that I can use double points and circular needles and stuff. So that's why, why I learned continental was just for the continental net stitch so that when I worked in the round. Uh, over time, I gradually, my knitting style evolved and I finally learned a really good way of purling that worked really well for me. And that was a game changer. It made uh, transitioning from knits and purls very quick and easy, the most efficient of any other continental knitting style I had tried and of any English knitting style. I was happy to knit on double points or circulars at that point. And then my kids were in sports and I was up in the bleachers, either in a swimming pool or at a figure skating rink. And if I dropped a double pointed needle, it would go bouncing down the concrete steps. And so then I started doing magic loop. And that was when I realized I could use a 32 inch circular needle for anything. And I, all I had to do was change my technique. So I could knit flat with the 32 inch circular. I could knit a sweater in the round. I could knit some, a sock using magic loop. I could use a, uh, knit a hat starting with traveling loop and then shifting down to magic loop when I got to the crown decreases. I would never have to change needles. When I was looking for a needle, all I would have to know is that I need a size five or six or whatever, I wouldn't have to worry about how long it was because it was going to be 32 inches. My favorite circular needles are also from Signature Needle Arts. She retired last summer and so those needles are discontinued. 
So the ones that I tend to buy now if I need them are Chowku, and I tend to buy fixed length circulars if I can. Those are my favorites. AJ Bartlett 10.09 says, you were the first YouTube knitting podcast I started watching faithfully. Congratulations on 300 Casual Friday episodes. I appreciate that your channel isn't full of yarn acquisitions, project bags, and cutesy progress markers and needle stoppers. I know you are all about the cables and texture. Do you dislike actually knitting lace or is it just impractical for your lifestyle and Minnesota climate? Why has knitting drawn you in, in to the point that you completed the master hand knitting course, but you aren't really interested in crochet other than how it incorporates into knitting like crochet provisional cast on? I don't hate lace knitting. I don't dislike it. I will do it every so often. Usually it's a gift type of thing or know if I have let me see if I have something here years ago I did this uh, sampler scarf I did it in two lengths one full length and then the other one was the shorter one that has like a little keyhole in it and it's like a lace sampler I thought it, it would be good as a, a teaching thing for lace and I enjoyed knitting it it was fun to design I joined knitting I don't wear accessories like this I don't wear lace shawls and so I, you know, lace shawls are probably more interesting to knit than a blanket or a scarf, but not that much more for me. Like, it, so it isn't that I dislike it. I like looking at it and sometimes I enjoy knitting it. It's just, I don't use it. Uh, and as far as crochet goes, there was a point when I, after I'd started the master hand knitting program, it was probably a couple of years into it. I thought, you know, you really should learn more about crochet because I, I really didn't know anything about it and once in a while I would have to trim something like a hat or something with it and I would have to use the directions that they had in their pattern in order to get myself through it so I got a book uh, crochet for dummies I think and it's a really good book and anytime I need to crochet I go use that book because I think it's it's an excellent reference book during my sweater project journey there were sweaters in certain decades that often incorporated crochet with knitting and my 1920s sweater had that. Let me go get that. That was uh, this uh, 1920s sweater it has these, they call this a turreted neck, these little squares going around the neck. And then the cuffs down here are also crocheted and then there are these slashes along here that there's just crochet around the edges of those. I knew I needed to kind of learn more about crochet in, in order to do a good job on this project and one of the things that I really was uh, wanted to do was create these black line the, the edgings without it being toothy looking and so I, I worked a lot on that I, I did so many practice things on crochet for that so I really that was interesting you know to, how to get that specific effect I think I just because I'm a sweater knitter and you know I'm used to seeing sweaters that I would buy were knitted they were not in crochet and uh, that's just, I enjoy knitted fabric. It has the drape. The kinds of things that I like to make and wear, typically I like knitted versions of them better. So, you know, things that I think crochet, I really like the look of in crochet are things that I wouldn't make, like little stuffed animals, or I, I've made a few blankets, not crochet, but knitted. I just don't like making giant rectangles very much, uh, regardless of the skill or the technique used. So I think, you know, there are crocheters who, st who, who were knitters and then they, they found crochet and they're like, oh my God, I love this so much more. And you could say, well, why don't you like knitting more? It's cause, cause they like crochet. So I just like knitting and I don't dislike lace. I just don't wear it. So I tend to make the things that I know I'm going to wear. So here I have some questions about the channel. The first one comes from Worst Horse and it says Mazel Tov. Congratulations on such a fine achievement. So many have benefited from your cogent tutelage. I hope you appreciate how much and how many. You've slogged through so many challenging life events, but it never did the quality of your offerings falter. Gratefully received. What keeps you going? So I often tell people that my main personality trait is that I'm an information seeker, but closely following that is that I am an information sharer. I 
am literally driven to learn. I can't help myself, but I'm also really excited to share what I've learned with other people who are interested in hearing about it. <laughs> so that is really what keeps me going is that I trust that there are people out there who are interested in what it is that I have to say. And so far that's been true. Marie Hansen 2534 said, how long did it take to achieve 300 episodes? I don't know how YouTube was started, but I find it really useful for tutorials and podcasts. Something I think there must be tutorials for that. I will just quickly go and have a look and two hours later, I return not much else done, but I know about the thing I was trying to figure out. I enjoy your visits and seeing you excellent and look so well. I went over sort of the history of my channel and how that relates to the history of YouTube. When I had 100,000 subscribers, I did a, an, a Ask Me Anything um, series of videos back then, which I will link to down below. The quick and dirty answer is that I started doing Technique Tuesday videos in early 2017. And after I'd been doing that for a year, I felt like I had other things to say other than directly instructing about a specific technique. I really missed being in the yarn shop every week that where I, I had taught had closed down, which is why I was doing technique videos on YouTube. And I really missed just interacting with knitters on a regular basis. And so that year I decided to get out in the knitting community more, but also um, to do a second video each week and that I would call that one Casual Friday. And it would be about what I was learning. I wouldn't be necessarily teaching something that does happen occasionally, but it'd be about what I'm learning, what I'm exploring, what I am finding interesting in knitting or textiles. So Casual Friday, the very first one was at the beginning of January in 2018. And for three years, I did two videos every week, one technique video and one casual Friday video. And then it started to, we were in the pandemic and it was starting to feel like a bit of a slog. And so I decided to let up on doing technique Tuesday videos and started doing those about every other week. And then a year ago when I started having some health issues, I stopped doing technique videos at all for the summer. And then since last fall, I have been alternating a technique video one week with a casual Friday video in the, in the other week. But I will leave uh, links down in the show notes to the videos that I did when I hit 100,000 subscribers so you can learn more about the history of my channel because my very first knitting video actually was uploaded in early April of 2007. So I've been doing YouTube for 17 years. <laughs> That's a long time. Nicole Fontaine 1720 says, I love the color of your new sweater. It's so lively. So that would be the sweater that I'm working on here. I've actually finished the knitting on it. It just needs to get put together. So this is the, the sweater she's talking about. I wonder what is the most rewarding for you in sharing these videos. I mentioned that I am primarily an information seeker followed by information sharer and it's really nice to be able to share what I know, and what I'm interested in, but it's rewarding <laughs> to have people interested in what I'm talking about. So when people comment that something really helped them, whether it's a Casual Friday episode or a Technique Tuesday, if something I did really helped them understand more about knitting or help save their project, that is fantastic. I've met so many people who said, you taught me everything I know about knitting. I've become such a, a, a much better knitter since I've been watching your videos. That is thrilling to me. Um, people who say that, oh, I binge watched your casual Fridays when, you know, I had knee surgery and I couldn't do anything all summer and just watched your videos. You really helped me get me through that. That that's wonderful to hear. I love hearing that. Lo J Crochet asks, I'm more of a crocheter, spinner and weaver. Your Technique Tuesdays have helped me immeasurably to knit better and to enjoy knitting. I enjoy watching your casual Fridays and catching up on what you've been working on and all the interesting little tidbits. As this is your 300th casual Friday, do you ever get tired of the demands of the social media end of creating? I don't because the way I participate in social media is not in order to promote my channel. <laughs> I went on Facebook, I think back in 
2007 is when I, you know, I, I went on Facebook, joined YouTube, and then uh, joined Ravelry that summer. Like all of this so kind of social media stuff I started in 2007. Over the years, uh, I became less enamored of Facebook and then I was on Twitter and now I don't like Twitter and Instagram. Like, ugh, you know, this it's okay. I just don't use social media in order to promote my channel and what I'm doing here. I use social media for myself personally to see what my friends are doing, to see what people who are doing interesting things are doing in their creative worlds or their scientific worlds or linguistic worlds, whatever it is. I just don't worry about it. I mean, I think about it sometimes. Oh, I really should be promoting. And I just like, I can't be bothered. So, uh, so I don't, and it doesn't get in my way. Knitting Polar Tree says, hello, I've seen all the Casual Friday episodes. At first, I binge watched them. Now I patiently wait for them to come. Thanks for sharing and teaching me so much. What's your favorite part about making these episodes? When I started Casual Friday, I, I mentioned that there were a couple of things I wanted to do that year. One, I wanted to get out more in the knitting community. And also I just wanted to talk more about knitting. But one of the things that I thought it would be good for, and it has been good for, is making me do the things that I want to do or that I say that I want to do. Uh, one of the other things that I wanted to do at the beginning of 2018 was to experience knitting with other wool breeds because I felt like I only ever knit with merino, Peruvian Highland wool, mohair sometimes. There just weren't a lot of different wools that I had experience with. And so my goal was to seek out other yarns that were made from different wool breeds. As I worked on that, I discovered that it was hard for me to find any. I finally thought I'm gonna go to our local fiber festival and surely I'll be able to find yarns from other wool breeds there. And I couldn't. What I found was raw fleece or combed, you know, combed top or roving or things like that that were for spinners and I had been actively avoiding learning how to spin for 13 years. I The reason for it for the first seven was because I didn't want it to interfere with uh, the master hand knitting program. I didn't want to get distracted and I was really worried that if I started spinning pretty soon I'd have sheep in the backyard, that kind of thing. But once I finished the master hand knitting program there wasn't a reason not to learn to spin, it was just habit. Like I, I absolutely would not pursue learning anything about spinning. But when I was at that fiber festival and I came across some washed locks of different fleeces and I saw how different they looked, that was when I'm like, oh, getting yarns made from different wools isn't really going to inform me the way that actually starting with the fleece, which are, they're so different. Like that's the way to learn. And that's when I decided I'm going to learn how to spin. And that sent me on this journey of learning more about wool breeds, but also learning about spinning and learning how uh, yarn is milled. And, and so it just, it gave me a direction of like, here's what I think I want to do. And the channel is going to keep me accountable. It's going to make, cause I'm going to have to have things to talk about. And then as I start pursuing those interests, I find even more uh, things that to, to explore and that I can then share on the channel. So really that my favorite thing is that, that casual Friday pushes me to do the things that I say that I want to do. Kay Bellor says, Hi Roxanne, I just wanted to say that as I have downsized my budget in retirement, you are one of the makers that I continue to support. I know it's just a cup of coffee. No, it, it's really, it means a lot to me to have monthly Kofi support. It's, it's incredible to know that there's that many people who care enough about what I'm making that they would just send me $3 or $6 or $5 or whatever it is per month. That's Fantastic, it's not just a cup of coffee. <laughs> then she says, not the most creative question, but I would love to know where you see the channel and your making going over the next couple of years. So I'm never sure where the channel is going. If I'm starting to feel like I'm in a rut or I just am not feeling that great about some of the videos I'm making, like I'm like, eh, well, that was a video. It wasn't great, but it was a video. I start thinking about what I might want to do differently. And usually it's like, what do I want to do differently? Not 
how do I want the channel to be different? It's like, what's going on in my creative life that could be different that would set me off on some other new learning adventure? As I mentioned, you know, I started out just Technique Tuesdays every week, then I was doing both videos every week for three years and that was fine. And then as it got to be kind of a drag, I let go of doing as much of the technique videos because those in many ways are a lot more work on the, the casual Friday. When I was kind of in a health crisis a year ago, I'm like, okay, I need to do something uh, different. I need to, you know, to, to let some things go a little bit in order to concentrate on my health for a while until I can get back into things. And, and then, and I just listen to myself and I don't, spend my time thinking about how am I going to please my audience? What do, what do they want from me? What, you know, what am I not giving them that they want from me? It isn't that I don't care about my audience, but I, I care more about me and what this does in my life and how it affects me personally than I do about trying to please the audience at my own expense. So really what keeps me going is just listening to myself and following my own desires. Aura de Flora says, happy 300 and many more. I love your deep dives into so many knitting topics and the links to great information. You are an inspiration. Do you ever lose your show mojo? Well, that's kind of related to what I was thinking. There are times when I'm like, uh, this is getting to be a drag. Sometimes it's because, you know, a parent has died or I'm really concerned about some, some other stressful thing in my life. And I think, well, I just got to make this video and, and um, I just got to push through because, you know, keeping my schedule really helped me. And often what I will find is it's not helping me. Um, I need to not try to think about the video. I need to focus on what's going on in my personal life. And so then sometimes I'll just say, I'm sorry, there's not going to be a video today. It doesn't happen a lot, but it happens once or twice a year. Something happens and I keep thinking, I'm going to make that video. I'm going to make that video. And then I get to Friday and I'm like, I can't focus on it. I need to focus on the thing that's actually important and not casual Friday. So these questions are sort of in the other category. They're about other creative activities or just other random questions that people have. Mary Mitchell, 6733 said, I've been knitting for about 65 years. When I come upon a technique I don't use often, I always peruse your tutorials first to see if you've covered it. When I tackle a larger project like a sweater or a big shawl, I try to be sure there's a skill builder involved. Thank you for your generosity and sharing your vast knowledge. You are welcome, Mary. I am really happy to hear that after 65 years, you are still learning new things. That is my goal as well. I've been knitting now for 38 years and my consistent goal is to keep learning so that knitting remains interesting. 907 Craig says, are you considering pursuing any certification like the Master Hand Knitting Program for spinning? And the answer to that is no. I'm just not interested enough in spinning to want to put that kind of energy into my spinning life. I got into spinning because I was interested in other wool breeds and then I got interested in just how yarn is constructed. But I really like working with wool. And I like the kinds of things I like to knit uh, involve certain types of wool. And I like, I'm not that interested in in spinning with cotton or silk or doing art yarns or core spinning. Like there's all these things that you can do in spinning, which is fantastic, but it doesn't produce yarn that I would want to knit with. And so it just hasn't captured me. I always feared that I would become very obsessed with it. And like I said, have sheep in the backyard or something. But it hasn't done that. It's, it's interesting to me. I like it, but I'm not obsessed about it. Nikki Norris says, I'd love to know more about your machine knitting experience. I recall that you used a knitting machine many years ago, mainly for others, kids, question mark. And then you stopped. I can't remember why and curious if you'd take it up again, speaking as someone who started learning about it and bought one about the time you started spinning. So I have thought about it. I I bought a knitting machine when my oldest daughter was just about a year old. She will be 30 
the end of the year. So I bought it 28 and a half years ago. And there were a couple of years where I was really interested in designing cotton intarsia kids sweaters, learning to design and coming up with these ideas and making the sweaters. And I really enjoyed it. And I was you know, trying to figure out how I could sell them. And then I realized, well, what I enjoyed was the designing it and then seeing my design come to life. But I really wasn't interested in becoming like a, a manufacturer of sweaters, like making the same thing over and over, or trying to sell them. Like that isn't what I was interested in. So I have thought about getting back into machine knitting. My knitting machine's been down in the basement, packed away for uh, at least 20 years, if not more. And the past few years since I've been in this office where I've had more space, I have occasionally thought about bringing it up here, but there's always the issue of storage and, you know, how am I going to take it out and use it and put it back? How, how can I kind of rotate amongst the different crafts that I have available? I also remember that I didn't like the distance I had between my hands and the knitted fabric when I was machine knitting. I recently I've been, you know, decluttering, getting rid of stuff and really thinking about what do I really want and what do I don't want. And so I've decided that I'm going to, I'm going to find a, a new home for the, the knitting machine and I'm not going to get back into it at all. Just don't see it happening. BS Smith says, love your podcast. Are you still doing genealogy? And the answer is yes, but not as obsessively as I did before I started doing so much YouTube. So genealogy was a real obsession for me for probably 10 years. And I found a lot of um, about my family tree, my husband's family tree. I put together some family histories and certain branches and I have way more to do. But there's only so much time and there's only so much obsessive energy that I have to focus on things that are interesting to me, sort of like projects. And I think of the channel as kind of a project, an ongoing series of small projects. And it just takes a lot of mental energy to be able to focus on a family tree. I mean, the research part in some ways is easy because you can do that in little bits and pieces, but putting it all together and in context in a form that's readable to people who haven't done the research is very different. It's something that I really want to get through while I still can. And I don't want all of this stuff to pile up, but it just, it's like you got to choose, like, what are you going to focus your energy on? So I can't do everything. I try, I'm trying really hard to figure out how to rotate between sewing and knitting and spinning and also YouTube. Um, so, so that's enough sort of balls in the air, but I do really enjoy genealogy. I'm still, I'm on ancestry.com at least every week looking something up or maybe somebody sends me a message and wants to know about something on the, my tree and I, and I interact with them. So I am on it and I go into the newspapers.com uh, website a lot to look things up, but I'm not as focused on doing genealogy as I was before I started doing YouTube weekly. So this next batch of questions are sort of specific technique questions, quick questions that people have. Andrea says, I am embarking on a sweater knitting journey and I'm considering how to translate design ideas I have for say a neckline silhouette into the actual stitch count rows and shaping techniques I need to execute. What processes helped you the most? The light bulb went off for me when I started the master hand knitting program. And it was like the first couple of questions where they were having us do these swatches and it was just like stockinette and ribbing or garter stitch and stockinette. And, or there were some where they were doing some mirrored increases or mirrored decreases. And they were asking us to compare gauges and there was like some seed stitch and some cables. There, there was various different things. The whole first level of the master hand knitting program is about tension and gauge and understanding those relationships. And it just wasn't anything I had ever had to think about. And, but that was when the light bulb went off and I went, oh, this has to do with how wide do you want it to be? How many stitches per inch is your gauge and therefore how many stitches can fit into here? Or how many rows do you need to get make something this long and make it shift from being this wide to this wide? Like, 
how do you do that? And it was just like the light bulb went off and I'm like, oh, and then I was able to design a little shrug for my daughter and figure figure things out. But there are other ways to learn about that. If, if you don't understand the relationship between gauge and measurements, I have been doing a series of videos on design. I started at the early part of the year and I just started doing them again. Uh, the past couple of technique videos G go through like here's how you calculate what you know if you want a rectangle this big here's how you figure that out if you want to apply a stitch pattern here's what how you might need to adjust that stitch count um, because of gauge or because of symmetry in the stitch pattern i have a whole video on sweater designs like sweater styles that talk about different types of sweaters and then there are are things about like converting necklines and it's not a complete step by step but it gives you the concepts and it will go through examples so those are some videos that i have that can help with that another is to when you're de designing something for yourself don't try to invent the entire wheel again <laughs> just do the hubcap <laughs> So start with something like Ann Budd's books, uh, A Knitter's Handy Book of Sweater Patterns. These are all bottom up books, but she's got uh, another one on top down. She's got a book that's uh, all different types of things. It's got mittens and socks and hats and a few sweaters in there. And she has them with different gauges in different sizes from like a kid's size four up to an extra large adult. So you can see what the stitch counts are, but there's schematics for them. So you can see what the measurements are and you can start comparing like how, how, how does this work and how are they using those numbers? How does that work out? Um, so those are the kinds of things you need to, to learn is, you know, uh, gauge and measurements and how they work together and then looking at the silhouette that you're trying to create and how to fill it. Kath M. Hall says, I'm a maths and computer nerd as I believe you are. My question is, have you tried sequence knitting and the different textures it creates? I have. This is the book that she is talking about. It's called Sequence Knitting and the idea behind a sequence is that you have a particular stitch pattern repeat that you just and usually it's one that's easy to memorize and you just are repeating that over and over again and you might do something like have a number of stitches um, that is not equal to the multiple so like say you have a multiple of four but the number of stitches you have is a multiple of four plus three so you're not going to finish the whole sequence when you get to the end of the row and then when you start the next row you start at the sequence again so you get these offsets and so uh, if you had a multiple of four plus one stitches or multiple of four plus two stitches like how does the stitch pattern play out differently the other thing you could do is uh, you finish you wherever you are in the sequence and then on the next row you just continue on with so if you ended with the the third of four stitches of a four stitch repeat at the end of the row you do the fourth stitch at the beginning of the next row so that's if you're working flat and then there is like if you work in the round how do those sequences work when you aren't working with you know an absolute even number of the multiple it's a really interesting uh, way of thinking about knitting and it can make the knitting relatively mindless because you don't have to keep looking at uh, the instructions like what am I supposed to do in this row you, you know what you have to do it can still be a little tricky you have to learn how to read your knitting and where am I in the sequence but it's a really interesting concept and I have designed a few things for myself or just in general or for another person using sequence knitting I'll put a few things here on the screen so that you can see some of the things that I've done using sequence knitting. I'm not sure how to pronounce this next word. This is somebody who comments a lot of my videos and I'm just gonna say X Bajewska 4197. I probably pronounced your surname incorrectly, but I did my best. I would love to ask something significant, but what I really want to know is, how do you keep your Chowgu red lace needles from coming unscrewed? Well, I have two answers to that. The first one is, most of the time I don't have to worry about it because I will use a fixed length circular like this one. I do have a set of minis, the ones that are for like double zero or triple zero up to US size one or two, something like that. And those have much thinner cables than the cables that you have with a fixed length circular. 
here's what I mean by that. These are both US-1, which is 2.25 milliliter or millimeter needles right here. Uh, one of them has a regular uh, cable right here, and the other one has the mini cable. So this is the interchangeable one. It's much thinner and it's more flexible, and it's the one I prefer. Um, and the way that I keep it from unscrewing is that I don't. The right hand one, over time, will loosen up and I just have to retighten it. It just, that's just the way it works. So I have all the little tightening tools and I use them, but over time, just the, you know, from knitting, it gradually will loosen up. So fix length circular or just retighten. So these questions are sort of personal, health related, background related, that kind of thing. So the first one is from Anne Nett. I love the way you explain things. I always seem to understand what you're saying. Do you have a background in teaching? Gunza says, I really love your technique videos. Congratulations on your 300. I'm a knitting and crochet teacher, but I always say that you're mine. You said that you were also a teacher. How was your experience in the teaching world? Could you tell us a bit more about that? Uh, I wasn't a teacher, although in my professional background, I did have to do some teaching. So it was not, I, did, I don't have an education background, a certification. I never taught school or at universities or anything like that. But in my professional life, I worked in IT, specifically what we call the information center. This is back when we were putting computers on the desktops of corporate America in the late 80s. And so people needed help. And um, we would write training materials, uh, tip sheets, uh, answer helplines, uh, write newsletters. I also worked for a while as a um, writing end user documentation for in-house computer systems. Like, how do you use this screen? How do you use that screen? And then I ended up being the supervisor of the information center where again, I was work putting uh, local area networks in or in computers and, and doing training materials and things like that. So that in professional life, I had to do a lot of technical explanation in layman terms um, for people who were using the technology. After I had kids, I was a stay-at-home mom and I was working on uh, writing fiction and I was in writers groups and then I would sometimes do workshops on uh, analyzing plot structure of published books. So you could kind of, you know, cause, because we get all kinds of books about how a plot is structured, but it really helped to understand like, here's a published book, let's go through and let's look for all of the little uh, flagpoles or whatever in the plot structure. Um, so I would teach people that kind of thing. So I don't have a background in teaching, like I me, mean, it wasn't a teacher, but I certainly have done teaching throughout my adult life. Froggy has two questions. The first one is, knowing what you know now, if you could go back in time to your teenage self, would you have changed your future knitting career path? And if so, how? For example, would you have done your master hand knitter earlier and or gone into teaching? Well, I started the master hand knitting program the minute I found out about it, um, which was in 2005. I learned to knit in 1986. I was an isolated knitter for 19 years. My teenage self did not know how to knit. So she was crafty. She embroidered things onto her blue jeans and her painter's pants and things like that. But my teenage self was interested in a lot of things. And some of those were creative and some of those were technical. And I did not know what I wanted to do. I don't I liked exploring my options. I don't, wouldn't try to change my teenage self. Uh, what I would have liked to have been able to do is spend time knitting with my grandmother. She was a knitter and I was around her when she knit, but I wasn't around her when she knit and I knit too. So I would have enjoyed being able to knit with her and talk about knitting and learned some things from her that she might have known. When she died, I got all of her knitting stuff, her knitting bag and all of her knitting tools and it's a few knitting books and all her patterns and all that kind of thing. Uh, but I would have loved to have been able to sit and knit with her. Froggy's second question, do you ever plan to write a knitting techniques or other knitting related book? You have so much knowledge about all sorts 
for example, your journeys through time with your sweaters and socks and stockings, that would be wonderful to record and share in book form. I do think about it. People have suggested it to me, but it's like with the genealogy. It's like there's only so much creative energy and time that I have to do things. So in order for me to add something like a huge project like that, I would need to remove an equally large amount of creative work and time from my existing life. And I just can't figure out how to do that. I don't know. Maybe someday that will happen. Agent 31 or Agen 31? parentheses, Ron, uh, when you were working on your Edwardian sweater for your long-term project of knitting a sweater from each decade, in one of the videos about that sweater, you said something like it had surprised you how the knit pearl stitch combination resulted in the creation of its pleats. You always talk about one of your main goals in your knitting is learning new things. So I've always wondered if you ever explored further to find other stitch combinations that could affect the shape of the item, the way the knit pearl combination brought out those pleats. So if you don't know what Ron's talking about, let me show you that sweater. Uh, this is the sweater that kicked off a four year project to knit a sweater from each decade from the 1890s to the 1990s. And it was, it was I found the sweater pattern in an old digitized newspaper and there was just a line drawing of it and I was really fascinated by the knitting instructions and and how they were presented and thought it was they were actually very easy to understand even though not the way we would do them today but there was just the very final instruction was one that I couldn't picture, I couldn't understand what was supposed to happen. It was how the, the front was supposed to close. So after four days of trying to talk myself out of knitting the sweater, I finally just gave in. It's, I'm gonna knit it until I can figure that out. What I didn't expect was how the fabric would behave. You see how it's hanging in these kind of, you can see it in the sleeves, how it's, they're kind of like accordion pleats. Uh, and that has to do with the, behavior of the stitch pattern. So it's a, a 10 stitch repeat. It's like net five pearl five that's offset. But in that 10 stitch repeat, there's one column that's always a knit and one column that's always a pearl. And so when you have columns of knits and columns of pearls next to each other, the knit column will come forward and the pearl column will recede like in ribbing. But if that column of knits and column of pearls is separated, by columns of a mixture of knits and pearls that lie flat, you get this, these kind of crazy folds. And so Ron's wondering, you know, did I research to see other kinds of stitch patterns that, that would alter the shape of the fabric? I tried, but it's not really, like it's not a category of stitch pattern. It's a knit pearl pattern and Reading it and even charting it out never led me to believe it would do something like this. And I remember looking through Ravelry like accordion or like trying to f find patterns that might use a stitch pattern like this. I looked through stitch dictionaries, but I, I don't, in, unless you, you see it or hear about it or someone tells you, I don't know how you would find something like that, like deliberately, unless you just got yourself 350 stitch dictionaries and went through them page by page to see if there was anything like that. Or, you know, I don't, I don't know. If somebody knows how to go about researching that, let me know. But I did, I did spend some time because I was so amazed by it. It was so unexpected, but I haven't come across anything else like that. Lisbeth Van Ginneken says, when I discovered you, I watched all your videos one after the other. Technology Tuesday and Casual Friday. I learned a lot from that. Now, if I want to look up something, I first look at your playlist before I ask Google. How is your health now? Love, Lisbeth. And then Diana Thorpe kind of added to that question by saying, you've told us that you modified what you eat to improve your health and you happen to lose a size. Could you give more information on this, please? What did you change? Thank you so much for your videos. I've learned so very much about knitting from you. I've been a beginner for years and years. Uh, now with your help, I feel I can tackle intermediate projects. That's fantastic. So the health issues people are referring to is a year ago in February, uh, I ended up in the ER after I had two and a half hours of a very fast 
heart beat like 170 beats per minute. And, uh, and then two months later, it went on for 45 minutes. And I, I, was, I was just having these like daily, but for shorter periods of time. And it was something that had been going on for 40 years. And I had been told by doctors, there's nothing to worry about you. There's nothing physically wrong with you. And so maybe once or twice a year for a few minutes, I would have this really fast heart rate and it would go away. But something happened then uh, to change that. So that was an electrical issue with my heart. And as I was going to cardiologists to try to figure out the electrical issue, they also were looking at the plumbing and they said, your cholesterol is very high. And they ha their solution was procedures and medication. And I wanted to try lifestyle changes first. I did a few things that right away I weaned myself off caffeine that took three days and I stopped having a beer every evening um, because alcohol and caffeine are kind of irritants to the electrical system of your heart. I eliminated a lot of refined sugar and then I switched to basically the, the Mediterranean diet. I'm following a plant-based Mediterranean diet. So whole grains, this is like, Nothing that new that you haven't heard your whole life about how you should eat. <laughs> it's just I wasn't eating that way. Whole grains, fruits, vegetables, nuts, beans, legumes, good oils like olive oil, avocado oil. I wasn't trying to restrict my calories. Uh, I was just like eating real food and I eliminated ultra processed foods. So if you look at a package and it has a bunch of ingredients that you just wouldn't have in your kitchen, and it's wrapped in plastic, that's an ultra processed food. And then I started uh, taking a walk every night for half an hour at a good pace, but we, we go at a good pace. And uh, in the summertime, I ride my bike if I need to run errands that are within a couple of miles. All of that has eliminated the electrical issues. I don't have those. Again, once in a great, while I'll have a little woo for a few minutes, like the way it used to be. And then I did have to go on a very low statin, like the lowest, like I take half a pill every other day. <laughs> That's how low, but it, it's brought, brought it down enough that my cardiologist is gonna fire me in September, assuming, assuming my numbers are as good as they are right now. And I'll just be able to go to my regular doctor. Health is great, I feel great, and uh, everything is, is wonderful in that department. Well, I think that is it. That was a lot. Hopefully I'll be able to keep everything, all the questions and answers in this video and that it won't be too long. But thank you so much for coming along with me on this 300 episode journey. I really appreciate it.